we are here. So we're going to talk about Amabia. I love my PowerPoint, so uh, you'll get to see my joy of PowerPoint here. Um, thanks for welcoming or bringing me on here. It's been an honor to participate as part of the museum exhibition, and I think that we'll have some fun. So let's get started. Amabia. We're going to start off just giving you a little bit of history here. January 16th was the first confirmed coronavirus case in Japan. February 3rd, the Diamond cruise ship was quarantined in Yokohama Harbor as a plague ship that was carrying the coronavirus. February 13th was the first coronavirus death in Japan. February 26th, all sporting and cultural events were canceled. February 27th, all schools were canceled. And on February 27th also, an artist whose name is Orochiro, who specializes in these printed yokai scrolls, he sent what, as far as I can track down, is the first Amabie tweet on Twitter. And this is it. So um, Orochiro is this guy, and he's been working for years selling all of these different yokai scrolls, right? They're all his own artwork, and he has a bunch of them. And Amabie was already in his catalog and had been in his catalog for years. But Orochiro saw this opportunity to really highlight the Amabie scroll. And he posted this tweet that was basically just a short little, you know, speech about the Amabie. It's like at one time, um, there was a, you know, this creature that appeared, this yokai appeared who said like, in times of plague, show my picture and it will cure you, right? So Orochio did not intend to kick off a movement by posting this. What Orochio really wanted to do was sell you this lovely Amabie scroll, right? That's why he did this tweet. As you can see up there in the left-hand corner, it is hot. Um, it is 1,639 yen, so roughly about $17 US. And that was his goal. He's like, hey, um, maybe I can sell some of these scrolls during this time. At the time, coronavirus, we didn't know how big it was going to get. You know, A lot of people thought it wasn't going to be that big a deal. But he's like, hey, I'm going to sell some of my scrolls. So he made this tweet. The next day, an artist named I am Metal Chan, she responded to his tweet, not by buying his scroll, which I'm sure he was very sad about because that's what he was hoping for, but she posted this little tweet saying like, hey, you know what? I did an Amabie too a couple years back. Here's my Amabie. This was then followed by the artist Kitano Yokai Ten. And he actually really quickly, um, impressively, put together a full Amabie comic strip that illustrated the story. So the story is pretty basic. It says, you know, 1846, about 174 years ago, there was a light in the ocean. Um, an official from town was sent to investigate this light. He went out there in a boat. This strange creature, this strange yokai called the Amabie appeared. It had a beak like a bird. It had long flowing hair and it stood upon three legs. The Amabie spoke a prophecy. It said that um, the next six years will be a time of plenty, a bumper crop of prosperity. However, should there be any illness, and that's kind of the key there too, should there be any illness, um, sh show my picture and I will serve as a talisman against evil. So that's the yokai's prophecy, right? He speaks it. Um, and as noted in the comic, the next six years were in fact a time of prosperity and there was no disease. So the speculation is, hey, the Amabie must have worked, right? They must have shared the picture around. Um, good job, Amabie. So this little comic strip is made on February 29th. And this kind of kicks it off, right? Because as soon as people read this comic strip with all the historical context, they start making their own art. And it is phenomenal, right? The speed with which Japan responded to this Amabie is impressive. And I think, you know, you've got a lot of people at home. They don't have anything to do. Maybe they're not in their jobs. So they just start making art. And as you can see on here, there's some pretty cool stuff, not just drawn stuff like ceramics, Amabie cookies start coming out. Um, someone felted an Amabie purse, which I think is just astounding. And you can also see in these early pictures that the Amabie's color scheme, no one's really, because like, all the early Amabie stuff was black and white, right? So we're trying to like figure out, people are still trying to figure out what the Amabie looks like. So Kitano Yokaiten's here is blue with something, but you know, we started to get more of the pink coming in and this like sort of decorative um, 
checker pattern as people slowly get a solid mental image of what the Amabie is. Um, and it takes off like wildfire. So according to Yahoo's metrics, after that first tweet of the cartoon, there were 200 Amabie tweets over the next 10 days, right? So 10 days, people do 200 tweets. The next day after that, there is over 1,000 tweets. The following day, there is 23,000 tweets that have been tagged Amabie. So Japan, especially virtual Japan, goes in on this big. March 3rd or March 2nd, uh, this is as far as I can tell the first English language Amabie tweet ever. And as you see, it's not even really an Amabie tweet. So um, Matt Meyer, he does this tweet with several different prophetic yokai. Um, many yokai of healing powers um, they talked about in times of plague and pandemic i'll cover some of these later um, but he posts this so this is when it moves into english march 3rd another artist tokyo asechi makes an amabie comic called amabie comps this one i really love it's a great comic strip so basically it has the artist tokyo himself walking by um, the amabie peers gives its prophecy if plague should come and tokyo is like what do you talk about if there's a plague right now? Um, and the Amabie looks a little nervous and tries to run away. And he's like, get back here, get back here. He's like, my drawing sucks. Is it cool if I just take a picture of you? Um, this little comic strip, even shorter, takes off even more. Also around March 3rd, enter the boring academics. The dry, crusty old people start posting these tweets saying like, actually, if you look at the history of the Amabie, this is the Kawaraban where it first appeared. And they start giving these lectures. And then other dry, boring academics come in and they're like, actually, before the Amabie, there were several prophetic yokai, such as the Jinja Hime. And they start, you know, laying in the history. But most of Japan's like, we don't care. We stand the Amabie. And so more and more of this great, amazing Amabie art comes out. Um, also, because this is the internet, it takes very little time before the first sexy Amabie pictures start coming out because that's just the way things work. Um, and it starts to move beyond Twitter at this point. You know, people start to notice things. Um, and some of the sort of like bigger movers in there. So this um, is posted by Mizuki, Shige, Mizuki Shigeru's family. Um, they post his painting that he had done of Amabie, yes. Uh, I just got a great quote. As a boring, dry academic, everything you say is valid. Yes, I know it's true. All of us boring ac academics, we love this stuff, but it is boring compared to like a really awesome Amabie picture, right? The pizzazz is there. So Mizuki Shigeru family points up, uh, posts his painting that he had done for a yokai encyclopedia several um, years earlier. The owner of the original Amabie Kawaban posts this as well, saying, hey, this is it. This is the original image. Um, and then really like the superstars of Japan, the superstar artists start to notice this too, um, up to the point of amazing comic book superstar Junji Ito. He posts his own Amabie. And once this happens, like once Junji Ito posts his Amabie, I mean, it is just on. Amabie escapes Twitter, it escapes the internet, and it is now just everywhere in Japan. People start making Amabie products, like you can see these little bells over there. Um, other famous characters like Kumachan here, he puts on Amabie cosplay and appears on the cover of a magazine. And then all of a sudden, like everything's coming up Amabie all over Japan. Amabie udon, which I think is just brilliant. Um, Amabie pudding. Um, I really wish I could have one of those Amabie IPAs and some of that Amabie sake, right? It just like all of this stuff just comes out and it comes out fast and furious. Like, I don't know how they managed to produce these projects so quickly, but I think it's because a lot of people have very little to do. And so they are just riding the Amabie wave. Of course, because it's Japan, there is very soon a Hello Kitty Amabie. You can't have anything in Japan without Hello Kitty appearing. Um, and once all this happens, the government's like, hey, okay, if this is what people want, we'll roll with it. And the Amabie is adopted as the official mascot of their um, COVID, re COVID relief, you know, trying to get people to mask up, trying to get people to do social distancing. All of that is used with the Amabie character. And they, um, they print off these great Amabie coloring books that are sent out to children um, to color because they are not at school. They don't have anything to do. This is one of my favorites too. A Japan airline creates an Amabie plane 
that then flies all over Japan, sharing the image of Amabie with the entire country. Some really big stuff then starts to happen too. Like people create these Amabie sculptures that start appearing. Um, and you know, at this point, like I said, Amabie is just everywhere. Another weird, great thing that happens is also the Amabie conspiracy theories start to pop up, right? So we've left just making art. This is probably my favorite one. This is someone noticing that the Diamond cruise ship bears a startling similarity to the Amabie. And so perhaps the Amabie is not necessarily the, you know, plague warden or, you know, but is in fact the plague bearer himself. So it gets pretty funny. Um, but Amabie has gone. I mean, I don't know any other yokai ever that has done this, right? It's gone from relative obscurity. And I mean, fairly relative obscurity, like 10 seconds before Rochido sent that first tweet, I doubt you could have had a hundred people in Japan or even worldwide who would have known what the Amabie was. I mean, even people like me who do research into yokai, there are thousands of yokai out there, just thousands. There's, and the Amabie was relatively insignificant. Like it appeared once and blah, blah, blah. And then like, you know, here we are a couple months later, and it would be harder to find 100 people who don't know what the Amabi is. I mean, my mother knows what the Amabi is. If you asked her to name like 10 yokai, she could probably name the Amabi and maybe a fox, and that's about it. But now everyone knows what it is. So um, we're going to go a little bit further back in time now to look at some germ theory, and as well, we all know nowadays that diseases are caused by germs. But that's a relatively recent um, bit of knowledge, right? So in the 1760s, the first vaccine was developed by Richard Jenner. Um, it was quite an amazing thing. Richard Jenner basically noticed because at the time smallpox was a horrible plague that ravaged the world. And Richard Jenner noticed that people who worked with cows didn't get smallpox, um, but they did get infected by this thing called cowpox. Um, and so he's like, well, maybe if you get cowpox, somehow you can't get smallpox. Maybe that'll work. So um, in something that seems horrible nowadays, but it worked, and so we love him for it, he actually went and scraped some cowpox off an infected cow, put it in a syringe, and jabbed someone with it. And like, hey, maybe this will work. And he found that it did work, and he created the first vaccine, and it was incredible. Um, but it's still, we like still with this stuff, we didn't necessarily know why it happened. So it wasn't until 1860 and 1864 that Louis Pasteur uh, finally proved germ theory. So we knew not that long ago that disease was caused by germs. Um, before that disease, we knew what the cause of disease was, right? It was clearly monsters. Um, Disease was caused by ill winds or plagues or miasma or all these different weird thoughts, but a lot of it was personified by monsters. Um, and the cure to battle monsters was with other types of deities or gods. So like 735, 737, a smallpox epidemic kills off one third of the population of Japan. So by ancient standards, the pandemic we're going through now is nothing in comparison, right? One third of the country was killed off. In response, Emperor Shomu um, filled Japan with statues, statues of the Buddha as a way of fighting off this smallpox plague. He also commissioned the Daibutsu of Nara, uh, which is when I used to live in Nara, is still there and you can still go see it, but it's this massive statue of the Buddha that was commissioned as this giant talisman to essentially ward the country against smallpox. In early times, one of the things that they thought about in Japan was this idea of Yakubyogami, right? So Yakubyogami were these disease gods and they were thought to come from China or they were supposed to come from outside of the country and they would basically wander the country spreading disease as plague bearers. Small villages would set up these little warai ningyo, right? These little these, um, straw dolls as sort of like wards, right? But people also wanted a little bit more personal protection. So enter Shoki the Demon Queller. Shoki the Demon Queller is this great vicious guy who fights monsters. And you could buy a little picture of Shoki and put it above your house. And it was thought that that would protect him because he was so scary that people couldn't come in. Okay. Enough, just so everyone can sort of see each other chatting, it's kind of fun. Um, so another person was Ganzen Daishi. So he was this monk 
who was thought to have healing powers. And Gan Zendaishi also had a demon form, which is this right here. So he was another one where you could buy his image and put it above your house and it would protect your house as, or you could even carry a little amulet inside your purse or something. And it was using his fierce image to scare off these Yakubyogami that might come in. And you can still get these in Japan today. You can go to temples and you can get images of Gans and Daishi to hang in your house as sort of disease wards. Now in 1568, this odd little book here called Harikiki Gaki was written. Um, the person who wrote this, um, I believe is anonymous. Um, it's a book of medical knowledge that was written in Osaka. And it kind of comes off this then idea that disease was not caused by, you know, the Yakubogami, but it was caused by something very small, these very little bugs that would get into your body and cause various disease, right? So this here, this book, it has a bunch of these little creepy crawlies, and it describes how to fight them with various acupuncture and herbal remedies as well. Um, the Kyushu National Museum currently owns the copy of Harikikigaki. Um, and this book really helps sort of like change some of the, you know, change some of this ideas from this idea that there was these disease gods that walked to this idea of these little small creatures. Um, if anyone is into anime or manga, um, his book has evolved into this great comic strip called Mushishi, which is about this healer that wanders the country and protecting um, or curing people from all these little bugs. Now, as with everything yokai related, the Edo period is really where stuff gets kicked off, right? Um, up until then, we have things, you know, separating from a lot of years, right? You know, like we're jumping centuries here with each slide. Uh, but once we get to the Edo period, we're now going to start actually moving on at a slower pace. So in 1819, the Jinja Hime appears. Um, this was recorded by the scholar Kato Ebion in his diary, the Waga Koromono, right? And this here is basically the template for the Imabie, um, the Jinja Hime. Okay, so this was, is basically where the template comes for all these prophetic yokai to come, right? So Kato Ebion records in his diary that this long fish with a horned face of a beautiful woman and a sword tail appeared and it says, I am a messenger from Yugo, which is the Dragon Palace. My name is the Jinja Hime. For the next seven years, there will be a bumper crop, right? That's always key. Um, Amabi only promised six years, but the Jinja Hime is delivering. For the next seven years, there will be a bumper crop. After that, however, there will be an epidemic of Korori. Um, however, those who see my picture will be able to avoid hardship and instead have a long life. So that is the prophecy of the Jinja Hime. Now, in modern times, um, a lot of people will say that Korori, they'll translate it as cholera, uh, but cholera was actually not introduced to Japan at the time. So to the best of our knowledge, most likely Korori by the description of disease was probably dysentery. People liked the Jinja Hime. So you can always tell, I think, how much people really adopted a certain yokai by how many other people made art from it, right? So we've got this original picture of the Jinja Hime, but then soon followed by a lot of different art. So we've got a lot of art of the Jinja Hime at the time. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just jump from known history and advance my own personal theory here about the Jinja Hime, because I kind of like cryptids. It's one of my favorite things. I like Bigfoot. I like the Loch Ness Monster. And it's always fun to try and figure out what maybe they really were. Um, and the Jinja Hime bears an awfully distinct resemblance to an animal called an oarfish. If you look at the oarfish and you look at the Jinja Hime together, it doesn't take that much to say that, you know, I'm going to say that maybe the Jinja Hime was inspired by the oarfish. I mean, okay, so it's missing the sword tail and the oarfish, as far as I know, has have yet not been able to speak any prophecies, but I kind of think that this is where it all kicked off. Another key thing about the Edo period is that the Edo period was the beginning of Japan's 
mass media, right? So for the first time, Japan had the ability to create media for the masses. Before this, scrolls and things were meticulously handmade. They were one-off unique items. Um, they were precious, they were expensive. But in the Edo period, all of a sudden, it is for the masses. Uh, Japan captures a printing press. Um, and by capture, I mean that they went to Korea and forcefully took it in an act of uh, military aggression. So they stole a printing press from Korea. They figured out how to reverse engineer it um, to create their own uh, mass press. And they also created this thing called Kawadabon. And Kawadabon are basically like uh, the English word for them is broadsides. They're cheap. They're quick to produce. You can carve them out, slap them off, and sell them cheap. They're meant to be read and tossed pretty quickly. Um, people weren't saving them. They weren't great works of art. They were basically like also, a lot of them were um, sort of sensationalist topics, right? So like over here on the left, we can see the samurai that's been executed. Um, a lot of them were about local murders or really like, you know, sensationalist stuff, right? Because you wanted to sell a lot of them. And so you use, you know, what we would call clickbait essentially is what it is now, right? Kawara Bon were clickbait. They were cheesy, you know, crazy stuff that you could print and people would buy really quickly. Um, a lot of these early Kawaraban also in featured true life encounters with yokai because that was pretty popular at the time. So if you could sell someone on this idea that's like, oh, there was this real yokai that happened. Here's the story. Here's a picture, you know, bang, 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 you get sales. So these Kawaraban started appearing around the 1820s with um, these prophetic yokai. So they were essentially imitating the story of the Jinja Hime. So the story is almost exactly the same, right? So in the 1820s, we have Kudabe appears. Now Kudabe is obviously what's known as a chimera, meaning that he is a mix of different monsters, of different animals. He's got kind of a cat body. He's got a human head. Um, he seems to have a single horn. And Kudabe does what they all do. Um, bumper crop, if illness, share my picture, all shall be healed. Like the story never changes. Um, he was not very popular. Kudabe kind of like faded to history. Nobody liked Kudabe. But then in 1830s, we had a famine, the Tempo famine. And then the picture of the Kudan came. And the Kudan, once again, this is sort of a cow with a human head. Um, it was said to have been born. And same story, prophecy, share my picture, all shall be healed. While nobody particularly cared about sad old Kudabe, um, Kudan really took off. So we have a lot of art of Kudan. Um, Kudan actually is pretty interesting as a yokai because Kudan persisted all the way up into say like World War II, right? So in World War II, there was this um, story, there was a like, I don't know, story that sprang through Tokyo that a Kudan had been born and things like this. And so it, it actually stayed a pretty, popular yokai. Um, I believe that in the museum exhibition, there actually is a kudan, and they did a kudan story as one of these talks. So kudan does take off. Um, you get a lot of different art of the kudan. I think a lot of it, and you'll notice that a lot with these, is that one of the big difference, like what's the difference between the kudabe and the kudan? Part of it is the kudan looks cooler. I mean, I think honestly that that's a huge factor, right? I mean, look at that cow head there with those horns. I mean, that's just pretty awesome looking. He just looks cooler. And so for whatever reason, you know, people liked the Kudan better and that took off pretty well. All right, 1844, uh, the star of our show is about to appear by the way. So if people are like, what is up with all these cow people? And where are you even going with this sack? I promise that the star of our show will appear and is about to appear, right? So in 1844, the Amabiko appears in one of these. Um, the Amabiko is not really so great on character design. Whoever did the art for this one pretty much just whipped it out. We've got a big head and we've got three legs here. So this is it, same thing once again, bumper crop, Prophecy of Doom, share my picture. You know, none of that detail really changes. Now, in 1846, we have the Amabie, and this we've already talked about. Um, you know the story. Once again, printed just on one of these Kawara bonds to be quickly passed out. Almost everything is exactly the same here. We've got the three legs, which they share, but the Amabie is clearly a better character design. Um, 
why do these two have something in common? I mean, this is one of those things where like nobody really knows for sure. We don't have a time machine, um, but we can guess, right? That something that probably happened here is that, and this is also kind of my personal theorizing on it. Um, so don't take this as any sort of actual studied history. I'm just kind of like speculating this. I know that a lot of these koara bonds were made by traveling salesmen as well. That was one of the things of Edo period Japan is people didn't really travel that much. And there were certain people who were able to move from town to town. And one of those were salespeople. And the purpose of these koara bonds were to sell you koara bond, right? And it's a really kind of a great gimmick if you think about it. Uh, someone shows up and they've got a big stack of these papers and they're like, hey, here's a prophecy of doom. Um, all you need to not get sick is to buy this lovely image here, right? So you can kind of see how this gets propagated. And you, I would bet that somebody overheard this story once, you know, about the Amabiko, and then they just sort of like did their own version here, right? So they took the story, they didn't remember all of it, they took kind of the vague details, they gave it a better character design, um, but other than that, it pretty much stays the same. Now, over the years, the proceed like the successive years, you get a lot of variations of this same tale. Um, the Amabiko shows up in 1852. This is a totally different character design. We've got a fur creature here. Uh, the previous Amabies were both aquatic, but this guy is a mountain creature, um, which carries more in uh, line with the Kudan, who was also a mountain creature. So we're kind of merging mythology at this point. You know, we're taking the story of the Amabie, we're taking the relative name Amabiko, uh, which still has the word ocean in it, in the kanji there that you can see, and kind of like merging it with the Kudan story. Also, um, now we're getting even further afield. Uh, the Amabiko Nudo then appears in 1852. And this is another kind of merge with an existing yokai character, right? Which is um, these Nudo, these monks. You know, there's a, quite a lot of yokai monks. And so they kind of take the Amabi, 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 Amabiko story and they sort of like mash it in. Oh, okay, that's a great question that came up in chat. Um, can you explain the name Amabie? This is going to be fun. All right. Japanese language, um, if anyone here speaks Japanese uh, or reads Japanese, um, one of the interesting things about the Japanese language is that, um, and this is going to be a little bit of a side, but I think you'll find it interesting. So I'm going to go there. So bear with me a while on a small tangent. All written language on earth, and as far as I know, this is true of all written language, right? It could do one of two things, but it can never do both at the same time. It can tell you either meaning or pronunciation, but it can't do both. And um, I don't know why this is, but looking at people's names, for example, right? I can sound out what your names mean because the English alphabet tells you pronunciation, right? I can see Cheyenne Stradinger. I might be wrong a little bit on the pronunciation, but I'm probably not completely off, right? What does that mean? I have no idea, right? I have no idea. There's another person there. I can read that, Meadows. What does it mean? Hi, Meadows. Um, I actually know that what it means because I speak English, obviously, but um, it doesn't tell me anything, but I can get the pronunciation, right? Uh, Japanese, the language system that they use kanji, um, which they borrowed from China, it's one of their language systems, right? So they have several language systems. One of them, kanji, shows meaning, but not pronunciation. Another language system that they use called katakana shows pronunciation, but not meaning. And that's why this is, becomes a complicated situation. So if you look at the 1844 Amabie, Amabiko, right? That is written in kanji. So we have meaning, right? Um, the 1846 Amabie is written in katakana, which means that we have no meaning. We only have pronunciation. So ama uh, in the first Amabiko, you can see means ocean. Um, but the actual Amabia itself is written in katakana, so we don't know what it means. Um, it's just sounds that are strung together without meaning. We kind of guess, like um, the BA kind of means like biko, it could mean like um, person, or it actually means kind of like none. So there's like a, a bit of a feminine twist to it, you know, so we kind of know the gender of the Amabia. That's why you'll often hear the Amabia referred to as she, because of that perhaps kanji twist there, um, but we don't know because for whatever reason, Amabie is written in 
katakana. Um, if you looked at an 1852 how example, the Amabie Nudo, that is once again all in kanji. And so we know exactly what that means. Like that last Nudo there means monk. Um, it specifically means, as the word for monk is in Japanese, one who enters the path is what you can sort of like translate the word monk to mean because you're on the path of Buddha. And so you're a Nudo because you're one who enters the path. Um, and yeah, but that was a good question. Thanks for allowing me that little brief tangent. All right, more monks coming up here in 1852. Now this guy, um, and once again, you'll see, because Japanese is a wacky language, um, we have a mahiko, which is a new version, different kanji. They've switched the kanji for C to now it's the kanji for heaven, but they've kept the pronunciation of ama because hey, it's Japanese. That's kind of how things work. Um, it's a highly complicated language to master. So this new version, we now have a four footer and he has clearly adopted the face of Dadama, which is another Japanese and a specifically Buddhist character. Finally, in 1876, Amabie kind of um, gets its final form here. If you're a Pokemon collector, you know, this is the final form of the Amabie, which is the Adie in 1876. Once again, the name is written in katakana, so we don't know what it means. Um, and we've gone almost back to the beginning here from this sort of like goofy three-legged sketch here without much detail, uh, got a little bit better design here. And now at the end, we're once again back to just this sort of like goofy little four-legged thing with a tail. And that's it, that's sort of the evolution of the Amabie. It's also worth noting that none of these really had an impact, right? There is very little evidence and no evidence that I know of that their image was ever shared. There's no evidence whatsoever that the Amabie had any impact because all we have really is like, we pretty much have that one Quadabon and we have very little else. So most of these were probably like, Japan has tens of thousands of yokai, right? And many of, there's probably many more that didn't last through history. There's probably a lot more Kawadabans that were made that no one saved and they were thrown away. And so we don't know, we just don't know. Um, this is what we do know, but there's a lot there that we don't know. So Japan also, and this is another fun thing to learn, think about with the Imabi is like we talked about like Shoki the demon queller, you know, we talked about these prophetic yokai, is that Japan has often used its monsters as personifications of disaster, right? It's a way of when something really awful happens, of trying to sort of put a face on it, of trying to sort of like reconcile, what does this mean? You know, this awful stuff happens to us. So what does it all mean, right? Like this, like, for example, in 1855, um, Edo, now known as Tokyo, experienced this extreme series of misfortunes, right? There was a huge earthquake where over 10,000 people were, were hurt, 14,000 buildings went tumbling down. In 1857, there was influenza um, that was followed by cholera, 30,000 people died, um, and all of this happened in fairly rapid succession. And so as a way to sort of like process this trauma, Japan um, personified the trauma, specifically in these namazu A, which are these catfish pictures. Why a catfish? I don't know. Um, I don't know why they decided it was a catfish, but a catfish, there was this story that came up of a massive catfish that somehow lived underneath Japan and caused earthquakes. It was the rattling of the catfish that caused the country to shake. And so you see here in this picture here of the Namazue of people desperately trying to hold down the catfish. And that's pretty typical of a lot of these Namazue, right? It's like, if we can just keep the catfish from shaking, then it will stop all of this really bad stuff from happening. And artists, came and they created their own versions of these picture over and over trying to, um, you know, and they would sell these to people, right? So we're, we're lassoing the catfish, we're lassoing the monster. Um, and I think, you know, that's another one of the things about yokai that you'll see as a constant theme over here, right? How did the Amabie start? 
guy was trying to sell a scroll. That's how this all went. How did the original story start? Guy was trying to sell you a Quora bond. And now we're up into Edo period once again, where these are all commerce items, right? And that is the way it is. Like if you, you know, in the earlier slides, we saw all the stuff that people were selling of, of um, Amabie products, right? So a lot of folklore actually passes through commerce. And I think that that's kind of cool. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. So Japan, as I said, has often personified their trauma through making it into a monster. And as someone astutely notified, noticed in the chat here, Japan still personifies its trauma by making it into monsters. Um, I think as almost everyone knows right now, Godzilla is essentially the manifestation of the nuclear bomb, right? Of being bombed, of which Japan to this day is the only country on earth to have ever uh, been bombed by a nuclear weapon, not once, but twice. And Godzilla is sort of the reaction to that. So yes, Japan has been doing this for a very long time. So in 1857, um, some more prophetic bird, you know, creatures started coming out. This is the Yogen no Tori, uh, and which basically means like, yes, people have noticed that I forgot to change the kanji here. You guys are so much smarter for this than the last time I've given. Why weren't you here to proofread my slides before I sent these all up? Come on now, I'm going to be sending it to you. Um, the Yogen no Tori. So this guy here is, you know, he's a bird. He's a two-headed bird. One head is uh, black, one head is white, and he does the thing, right? bumper crop, share my picture, all will be healed. So these prophecies are still coming. In 1862, we have the epidemic of measles, which gives rise to this picture here, which is the hashikae, which are the measles, um, measles pictures, essentially. So measles is a fairly periodic disease. Uh, about every 20 to 30 years, there is a measles epidemic that basically hits Japan. Um, and I think that the measles, the Hashikie is kind of interesting because Japan gets a new hero here to battle the measles specifically. Like if you saw before, if you remember our old pal Shoki, the demon queller from earlier sides, we now have the new hero. Here is Lord Rice. So Lord Rice is here. He's got a big thing of rice and he's using it to tackle and fight the Yakubyogami, the disease bearer down there that is part of the Hashikie. Okay, so 1854, um, as I'm sure a lot of you know from your history, uh, the black ships appear and the Edo period is over. So Japan's time of isolation ends. They have contact for the first time with people outside of their country, not the first time, but the first time in a long time. Um, it brings new ideas of science. It brings new idea of medicine. It entirely revolutionizes the country. It also brings new diseases. In 1886, Japan has its first experience with cholera. Uh, cholera sweeps the nation, brought in from overseas. This here print is what is considered to be at the time, a personification of cholera, right? So we've got, once again, a chimeric monster that has the face of a tiger. And as you can see on its back half, there is a tanuki that you can see by the very large um, scrotum, shows you that this is a tanuki. And this is the personification of cholera uh, in art form. This is also, once again, an advertisement to sell you plum vinegar, which was sold as a miracle cure for, for cholera because so much of these yokai art comes from commerce. 1918, we have the Spanish flu infecting one third of the population of Japan. And along with that, the government actually puts out these great little manuals. Um, the Japan San Central Sanitary Bureau publishes these manuals where it's showing people how to prevent Spanish flu infection. And Spanish flu here is once again, they bring back our old friend, the Yakubyogami, which are spreading the Spanish flu across Japan. So all of this, right? We've got a lot of monsters here I've shown you. And 
I think one of the interesting questions is why the Amabie? Japan has this vast history of yokai, right? They have so many yokai. There's been a lot of prophetic yokai over the years. We've got the Kudan, um, we've got the Jinja Hime, who was actually first. Why has the Amabie become the personification of Corona? Um, why not the Jinja Hime, right? I mean, she was first after all. Shouldn't she have, you know, right of you know place with there but i think that a lot of it is boils down to character design because the amabie is just so cute and so fun to draw and so fun to replicate and i really think that especially when you look at a lot of the like we've gone through this show i think that the popularity of the amabie owns a lot to Lady Lovely Locks there with her pretty hair because it's so much fun for artists to draw. Like when you see artists doing their Amabie art, a lot of them spend a lot of time on that hair. Um, and I think that really that is why the Amabie has become the yokai of probably the modern age is that it was really the character design that people liked. They had a lot of choices to choose from, but this one made people feel better. And I think that's also the key to the Amabie is it makes it people feel better. And one of the really interesting things about the Amabie that is so different from all other yokai, you know, like all this stuff that we've seen before is that most of it was about trying to sell you something, right? A lot of it was like, you know, buy this scroll, buy this book, but the Amabie has become this phenomenon of make your own, which is totally different, right? It connects you into this world wide like um i don't know how to say it exactly like this just like this worldwide network of people making art and sharing it in a time when we're all feeling bad the amabie makes us feel better right and it gives us something we can do because they don't have to be great like every single person and i've done this myself and i'm a terrible artist but i don't care i drew an amabie and i shared it and it made me feel connected to people all over the world right Oh yeah, and they're not all cute. This is actually a friend of mine did this Amabie, which is the Amabie Godzilla mashup, I gotta say. But I really love the fact that it's here um, blasting the corona with its death vice, right? So this was pretty awesome. Um, but I mean, and we've done like we've done so much stuff. Like my friend uh, Lily Chan did this lovely series of Amabie postcards, and she made it with the idea that like you could actually mail an Amabie to people, and so it was just like this lovely way of staying connected and really feeling like like in a time of hopelessness. I feel that the Amabie really represents hope because once again, not only is she cute, you know, not only is she fun to draw, but it's also a reminder, I think, that. As a people, as a humanity, we have been through this before, right? This is not our first rodeo when it comes to pandemics. It might be our first, but it's certainly not humanity's. Like when we learn this history, when we look at this stuff, we realize that we have survived and we have prospered. And I think that Amabie is also a reminder that, um, that at some point in time, everything we're going through now will be a history lesson, right? Everything that we're going through now, all of this will be something like this. It'll be something someone's reading in a book years from now that they have no connection to, that it's just simply um, something that happened in the past. And that feels good, I think, in a way for us to know that eventually, you know, the world will write itself and there will be a way through all of this. I just saw someone post up, I want those yokai postcards. So I'm going to say, okay. They are available at yokaiparade.com. Yay, go get them. Um, they are great postcards. I love the Amabie postcards. Also, I mean, it just like, and that's part of the other thing is like making and sharing art of the Amabie has been really fun. Um, I made this little chat book here with the story of the Amabe, including a reproduction of the original Koara bond. You know, it's just been a great way to sort of like engage and create something positive out of a situation that's not particularly positive, right? There has been some question about whether the time of the Amabe will eventually be over. That, um, you know, there's all these other ones. So for a while there, especially like, like our same artist here, he drew a new comic strip about the Yogan Notori, which was these two birds. You know, it's like, is Amabie ever gonna stop being popular? But I honestly think that Amabie has reached so far that Amabie eventually did something that has not happened for a long time. And this was pretty amazing to be, to see 
and see it happen in real time is that one of the things that the Japanese religion allows for is the creation of new gods. Something can happen where you enshrine something as a deity. And this can happen with people. This can happen with, uh, with different creatures and things like that. So this is actually, as far as I know, the very first amabie that has been enshrined at a Shinto shrine in Isahaya Jinja shrine. So they, the amabie has officially been elevated from God to godhood now in Japan, where people can actually go and now worship the amabie um, at, a, at a Shinto shrine. And I have no doubt that there are many more of these that are happening as time goes by. That um, not only through 2020 did we get to see the amabie basically come from nowhere, come from absolute obscurity, but we also got to watch in real time the birth of a new god, a new deity in Japan, a new kami, which I think has just been absolutely amazing to watch. Boop, 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 boop. I know it was put in the chat, but there's all my information is there. Also, um, I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter is probably the easiest way to find me. So thanks everyone much for coming. It was really great. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.